Hello everyone, my name is Glenn Hall and this is part 9 of my series, The Mystery of the Beast. Today I'm going to continue with the head of the beast. This is part 2 of the head of the beast. I encourage you to listen to the previous video so you'll understand everything that I will talk about today. And as a short refresher, I want to go to Revelation chapter 12. Verse 3 says, Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. Then it's important to understand who this dragon is. If we go down to verse 7, we read, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Well, the dragon, that's the same dragon we have here in verse 3. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. It's important to understand that this dragon is the ancient serpent from Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent that deceives Eve so that Eve eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This serpent we know by the name of Satan or the devil. Both of those words are used here in Revelation 12, verse 9. It also tells us here that Satan is the deceiver of the whole world. In a previous video, I explained how Satan is the ruler of this world. Here in Revelation 12, we're set we're told that he's the deceiver of the whole world. Now that's important to understand because all of us have been deceived by Satan. I don't know if any of us even know the extent, the full extent that we've been deceived. For example, William Casey and he was a uh, past director of the CIA and was director under Ronald Reagan. In 1981, he said, we will know that our disinformation campaign is complete when everything the American people know is false. Now, it's hard for us to imagine what that means. The CIA, we've always respected the CIA. We've always thought that the CIA was important for national security. And there are many other security agencies. Under Donald Trump, we have learned that these security agencies, including the FBI, have been used against the American people. There have been many, many conspiracies against us as a people, not the least of which was 911. The 911 attack was not what we've been told. Many government officials were aware of it. The building did not come down because an airplane or two airplanes hit the buildings. Building 7 came down and nothing hit it. We've never been told the truth about 911. And that's just one of countless conspiracies against the American people, indeed against the entire world, because 911 affected the whole world. Here in Revelation 12, 
we're told that Satan is the deceiver of the whole world. Satan is the dragon. Satan is the ancient serpent from Genesis 3.1. And this dragon appears here in Revelation chapter 12 with seven heads and ten horns. Well, we just go down a little bit to chapter 13, verse 1, and it says, John wrote, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. Well, isn't it interesting? The beast looks exactly like the dragon. And who is the beast? If you have listened to the previous videos, you have come to understand that the beast is man. We are the beast. The beast looks exactly like Satan. And that's because Satan has imitated God. God created man in his own image. And Satan has been molding man into his image. And so mankind now, as a whole, looks like Satan. But the picture of the beast that we see in Revelation chapter 13 focuses on the heads and the horns has seven heads and ten horns, exactly what Satan, the dragon, appeared as in Revelation 12. Well, what are the heads? A head, a head is different than the whole body, isn't it? Consider, consider um, Jesus Christ. He is the head of, of the church, which is his body. He's the head of the, it's translated church in our Bibles, but the ecclesia, the called out ones. He is the head of the body. The head is different than the body. The head represents the body, though. So let's look now at Daniel. We're going to continue with the teaching from Daniel chapter 2. Dan, um, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the first king of Babylon who made Babylon into a great empire. This is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, and he has a dream. He asks all the wise men of Babylon to tell him what the dream was and to interpret it. Well, of course, the wise men couldn't do that because no one can read others' minds. And so Nebuchadnezzar was on the verge of killing all of the wise men of Babylon. Now it so happens that Daniel, who had been captured and taken captive to Babylon the year before, along with three of his friends, was part of what were considered the wise men to give counsel to the king. And Daniel was going to be killed along with the other wise men of Babylon. Daniel wisely asked the king for more time, for time for Daniel to pray to God so that God could tell Daniel what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and what it meant. And now we're at that point where God has spoken to Daniel in the night, and Daniel chapter 2, verse 24 says, Therefore, Daniel went in to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Okay, notice that, ba that Daniel intercedes for the other wise men. Daniel was a Jew. Daniel believed in the God of heaven, in the Most High God, 
practice the religion of Judaism as it was revealed to Moses and to the prophets. And the other wise men of Babylon were, would have been believers in other religions, believers in other faiths, false gods, things like that. <clears throat> and Daniel interceded for them. He could have remained quiet and just seen all of those people be slaughtered by Nebuchadnezzar, but he didn't. He spoke up for their lives. That's a lesson for us to be interceders and speak up for the lives of those who are captured, held captive by false gods. So we need to take that lesson to heart. In verse 25, then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah, a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show, the, can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be, ma may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Daniel approaches the king in humility. He doesn't claim himself to be great. He doesn't say it's because of, of my greatness of mind, because of my great wisdom, because I've achieved thus and so, O king. He doesn't come to the king like that. Instead, he points the king immediately and only to God. Now, again, that's a lesson for us to take. When it comes especially to the things of God, you know, I cannot go to the scripture or go to the Bible um, to acquire great knowledge and wisdom in my own strength. I could spend hours and hours and hours learning the original languages and I could go through minute detail of the language, the Hebrew language, the Greek language, and Daniel, the Aramaic language used to write the scripture and get into difficult word studies and so on in order to try to fathom the mysteries of God. But long ago, the Lord taught me that I was not to approach his word that way. He showed me that he would reveal his word to me in his time, according to his way, his plan, and as he wanted me to know it. And so over the years, the Lord has slowly but surely shown me things in his word. It's interesting, too, he gave me a wife who has the same heart for understanding the scripture that I have. And when the Lord brings one of us to a new understanding of his word, the new understanding of a doctrine that we were taught when we were young, then the other one of us will immediately come into agreement with that new interpretation. God always gives us a double witness concerning his word, concerning what he is revealing to us. The same is true with respect to this 
revelation that I'm bringing forth in these videos to you. I've never heard these things taught. I cannot tell you to go read any person's writings, books, blogs, or anything else that would explain to you what I am explaining to you now. But it's not by my own great wisdom or my own cleverness because I don't think of clever and witty things to say. I just simply try to tell the truth. I don't try to deceive people with my words. I try to explain the Word of God as the Holy Spirit leads me. And that's what Daniel is doing here with King Nebuchadnezzar. And he takes no credit for it because it is the God of heaven who revealed this to him. So now Daniel then begins to explain Nebuchadnezzar's dream to the king. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, and its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was the dream. That was the exact dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreamt. And so the first step for Daniel was to tell the king his dream. Well, do you think that got Nebuchadnezzar's attention? Of course. So now Nebuchadnezzar is going, what? Wow. So then Daniel goes, In verse 36, he says, this was the dream. And that was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold in the dream that he saw and that Daniel described. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these all these previous kingdoms. And as you saw, the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw, the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. <coughs> and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. I want to go back up to verse 35 
It's important to understand this. Verse 34, As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A mountain in scripture is a kingdom. The stone that struck the image is the rock is Jesus Christ. Jesus counsels us to fall upon him, to fall upon the rock, lest that rock fall upon us and crush us. This stone, this rock, is going to crush all the kingdoms of the earth. And that time is at hand. And that rock then is going to become a great mountain that fills the earth, a great kingdom that fills the earth. This dream, the consummation of the dream is talking about the kingdom of God that is coming and that will fill the earth with the glory of God. That's the first thing to understand from this. The second is this. The image that Nebuchadnezzar saw is composed of certain parts. And the first part is the head. Nebuchadnezzar was that head. He was the head of the kingdom of Babylon. And then as the vision or dream progresses... Daniel says, there will be other kingdoms come after you. Now, first take the idea that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of a kingdom. He is the head of Babylon. Then refer back to the teaching of a previous video where the parable from Daniel of chapter 4 where Nebuchadnezzar is made to be like a beast in the field, where he is sent out for seven times until he understands that God rules in the heavens. Until that time, he basically is like a beast in the forest, in the fields, and eats grass like the beasts. And so Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the beast. Now in chapter 2 of Daniel, we see that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of a statue. But taking into scripture now, an understanding of scripture, that's showing us that Nebuchadnezzar was a head, the beast. So now we combine that with Revelation chapter 12, concerning the dragon with seven heads. Revelation 13, concerning the beast that rises from the sea that has seven heads. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar is one of the heads of the beast. He is one of the seven of those heads. The vision progresses here, and you have several kingdoms come after Nebuchadnezzar. Now, many people believe that Nebuchadnezzar was the first head. And then they try to then understand what the rest of the heads of the seven-headed beast were, starting with Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom of Babylon right around 600 BC. Well, I don't think that Nebuchadnezzar was the first head. I believe that he was the third head. In Revelation chapter 17, which we're not going to read today, but John, an angel tells John, when John is seeing a vision of this beast, this seven-headed beast, 
an angel tells John concerning that beast, that seven-headed beast, that those heads are seven kings. And he says that five of those kings have fallen, one now is, and one is to come. That means that the kingdom that ruled at the time of John was the sixth head. Well, Rome ruled at the time of John. And so one of the successors of Caesar was the ruler of Rome at that time. And that ruler of Rome was the head that represented the beast at that time. So the kingdom of Rome, think of that as the head. And then any, any king of that particular kingdom would be incorporated in that head. And the sixth head, or Rome, ruled at the time that John was given the revelation. Now, when you look at the statue, you have Nebuchadnezzar, who is the head of gold. Then you have the chest of silver, and that's for the kingdom that came after Babylon, and that was the kingdom of Persia. Medea, Persia, it's called, but Persia was the main part of that empire. Cyrus was the great Persian king that we're going to be hearing a lot about in future videos. So you had Babylon, then Persia took over Babylon. And then after Persia, you had Greece. That's the part of the statue that is bronze. And then after Greece, you have Rome, and that is the part of the statue that's stone. Oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, iron. So you have iron as the fourth kingdom represented in the statue. The fourth kingdom in the statue, but, or in the image, but in the book of Revelation, the angel reveals that that is the sixth head of the beast. So working back then, we have this. The sixth kingdom is Rome. The fifth is Greece. The fourth is Persia. And the third is Babylon. So there were two kingdoms before Babylon. I believe that the kingdom... Well, the kingdom just before Babylon was the kingdom of Assyria, and that was the kingdom that destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. They took Israel captive and they dispersed Israel throughout their lands, and particularly to the north and up into uh, Europe and um, parts of uh, Russia, I think. So Assyria, and it's interesting, there are some prophecies concerning Assyria that we will be looking at later on that are very interesting and tie, tie together some thoughts with respect to uh, some of the prophetic issues we'll be getting into. And who was the first beast kingdom then? Well, I believe the first beast kingdom was Egypt. Egypt was the world power at the time that Moses led Israel out of Egypt. Pharaoh was the head of Egypt. So your six kingdoms are Egypt with Pharaoh as the head, Assyria then is number two, Babylon number three with Nebuchadnezzar as the head, Persia number four with Cyrus as the head beginning that kingdom, Then number five was Greece with Alexander as the first head. And then sixth was Rome with Caesar as the first head. And all of these were world kingdoms, world governments. They controlled most of the world of the time in which they ruled.
So the point is this. When we see the beast that rises from the sea in Revelation chapter 13, we have to make a distinction. A distinction between the head of the beast and the beast. See, the head is not the whole beast. And because we think in terms of uh, concrete images rather than concepts usually, and go back to the previous video I did on the reason why the Lord uses parables in the scripture. He uses stories and images to tell prophetic truth. So when we see the beast now in Revelation chapter 13, we are seeing a prophetic image. There are indeed seven heads of the beast, seven different, first seven different main people who were the heads of the various kingdoms, but they were not the whole beast. As we saw earlier, the beast is mankind. These heads ruled mankind. They are the ones who were responsible for all of mankind. And as in this vision, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, listen to what Daniel says. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he is given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Okay, you see, this king rules over the children of men, rules over the beasts of the field, rules over the birds of the heavens. Remember the stories of Robin Hood in England and how it was such a crime for one of the paupers of the land to kill one of the king's deer. The beast of the field belonged to the head of the government. So the head is responsible for the body. The head is responsible for the beast itself, just as concerning Christ and the body of Christ. The head, our head, Jesus, is responsible for us his body. And so we need to we need to see that and make that distinction because we have to begin to understand who the beast is. If we do not understand who the beast is, we're not going to be able to walk into this revelation that God is bringing forth at this time. It's it's very important that we understand who the beast is. And that we understand that God has appointed certain people to be the ruler, to be the head of the beast, of the people. Now here's another thing that's extremely important. And we have to... We have to be of this mind as well. Daniel was always extremely respectful of King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, especially chapter 4, when Daniel has to interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar as the huge tree being chopped down and Nebuchadnezzar being sent out into the fields as a mere beast. And Daniel cries out, Oh, that this would not happen to you, O king. Daniel respected, honored his king. And Paul teaches us also to honor and respect the king of wherever it is that we dwell. The people of God are not lawless people who rebel against their government. Daniel 
is the epitome of showing that respect and that honor. It's written into the law that you shall not curse a leader of your people. Have you noticed, for example, the incredible difference between the way that the opponents of Donald Trump speak about him versus the way that the people who did not like Barack Obama spoke about him? We did not make the slanderous statements against Obama that they make against Trump. We did not call for people to assassinate Obama like they call for people to assassinate Trump. There should be a huge difference between us and them. And let's look and see what happens next. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of, Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were the th those were the three friends of Daniel's, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So Daniel is actually brought into a position of rulership within the court of the king. The head of the beast, we have to make the distinction between the head and the beast. Yes, the head is part of the beast, but it's not the whole beast. And so let's remember that as we continue understanding the mystery of the beast.